Abba, you know why she had to say the K? Do you know why? Tell us why. See, what, look what they did. <laughs> they made me sit like the queen <laughs> of England. Come and and I'm, your, I'm your loyal vassal right <laughs> here at your side. Come nearer to me. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the, the K is because it's Carola was my name in Frankfurt. When I got to then Palestine, they said, uh, you can't be called Carola here because it's too German. So I said, oh, what, what am I going to do? And I had a middle name, Ruth. So I said, OK, I'll take my middle name, and I'll keep the K <laughs> to keep my two feet anchored in front of the mine. So I, that's why it's Ruth K. Westheimer. So what she did is she put it on the program. <laughs> I, I mean, on the, on the name tags. <laughs> So we, we don't want to lose that K. We certainly don't want to lose any piece of you. And Dr. Ruth, it is truly an honor for me to be here, to have a chance to have this conversation with you, with 300 plus of our closest friends sitting in and listening as we have this discussion with each other. And I know that for many who are here, they know you as a TV personality. A they short know, one. A short one. <laughs> on the TV, you're larger than life. They know you from TV. They know you as a, a sex educator. I know some of those here probably came thinking, what will she say that will turn the rabbi's face red? We'll see what happens later on. It's too dark here, <laughs> but I can see it. Oh, it'll happen. <laughs> uh, but really, the reason that we're here tonight, as you know, is we are here as part of our Holocaust Museum and Education Center here in Naples, which is a phenomenal organization. And we're here tonight to talk about your story in particular and your relationship to the events of the Holocaust and to learn about its impact on you and your story. And for those who haven't had a chance to see it yet, there's a beautiful documentary about Dr. Ruth that's available on Hulu. It's about an hour and a half. It's a remarkable story of her life. And I'd like you to, if you don't mind, starting in a place related to your story, tell us about the one thing that you have left from your childhood. Tell us about the washcloth. Boy, you did your homework. I can see that. Like, <laughs> ask your wife if I can hold on to your hand. Certainly. Does she permit it? OK. <laughs> All right. I'm somebody who likes to touch. So, and also, I feel like I'm sitting so high. Uh, here is um, on a serious note. First of all, I uh, command all of you. And then later, I'll show you. You get a gift uh, because of all of you here who are supporting a museum like that. Uh, in 19, I was born in 1928. On June 4th, I'm going to be 92. And uh, thank you. And when I was um, in 1939, on January 5th, um, I, my father was being picked up by the Nazis um, a few days earlier, right after Kristallnacht, after the night of broken glass. And he, he was in a labor camp. There was no concentration camp yet. He sent a postcard to Frankfurt. I was an only child. He sent a postcard. Carola, my name, has to join a group of children that are going to Switzerland so that he can come back to Frankfurt. I didn't want to leave. I was an only child. I lived with a mother, a father, and a grandmother in Frankfurt. Uh, the grandmother was a widow. She had nothing else to do than take care mm -hmm. of me. I had another set of grandparents in Wiesenfeld, uh, in a village. She was a farmer. And I didn't want to leave. When I saw that postcard, I remember that as if it was now. I had no choice. I knew because he had been taken by the Nazis after the night of broken glass. He must have been horrified. I looked at the window, and my father turned around and waved and smiled. And I'll tell you later something about an animation, remind me. So I knew that I had no choice. For some reason, which I will never know, because both my parents did not survive, the set of grandparents from the village did not survive. The grandmother didn't survive. Uh, for some reason, the only thing in that suitcase 
from Frankfurt am Main, not a thriller, which anybody like you would have expected, especially from an orthodox Jewish girl. The only thing that was in that suitcase was a washcloth with the initials KS, Carola Siegel. And for some reason, despite all of the countries that I've lived in, and I'm not a very orderly person, I'm really a pack rat, I pick up stuff and hold on to it. <laughs> for some reason, that washcloth has been with me through is Palestine, through my being in the Haganah, through all of the things we'll talk about. And I still have it. I don't let it get out of my sight. And all of you watch the documentary, Ask Dr. Ruth. I have to tell you something that you cannot tell Hulu. <laughs> Anybody who does not have Hulu, get it, you get it one month for free, <laughs> but don't forget afterwards to cancel. Don't tell Hulu. <laughs> So, Rabbi, <laughs> that washcloth came in wonderful now when I did the documentary. And as you know, in the Jewish tradition, in the Talmud, it says, a lesson taught with humor is a lesson retained. So, that's a, a, a wonderful first question. I know exactly where that washcloth is. When you come with your wife, where's your wife sitting? Raise your hand. She's over there, table okay. 12. I, I, he will go home with you, not with me. Even so, I'm holding on to him. <laughs> so uh, I will show you the washcloth when you come to my house. I will, I will love to see it. And it's in the video, which is why I, I saw it. I knew it was the one item that you still had from your childhood. I know that after the night of broken glass, things change forever. But can you tell us a little bit about your childhood yes. early on in Germany? Yes. So, first of all, I have, a, I have a couple of gifts for you oh. for doing this tonight. So, here is one book which fits into your museum perfectly because it's for junior high. It's called Rollercoaster Grammar. It talks not about Auschwitz because I wanted to be careful not to be threatening. I used to be a kindergarten teacher, so I know about education and psychology. So, but it talks about my father waving to me, and it talks about me being the grandmother, taking two of my wonderful four grandchildren <laughs> to an amusement park. We want to go on a ride, get measured. Two of my grandchildren can go on a ride, and I'm too short. <laughs> so, very fast about this book, I'm giving this to take home. Okay. It's called Rollercoaster Grammar, the Shoah Foundation. You, you don't know that yet, because that was after the film. In the film, there is an animation, a part is animated, because I didn't have enough material. I was 10, so I didn't have enough material. However, they had an Israeli animator who did a super job. And as we speak, Rabbi, the, the Shoah Foundation, Steven Spielberg, it has picked up the animation from the documentary has picked up some things from here, and there will be, this will go to all of the uh, schools, United States and Canada, and we, in April, will have a film to go with it. Children are going to like to see children in a film. First, I was scared about animation. I thought they're going to make me look like Pinocchio, or they're going to make me look like Mickey Mouse. I had this brilliant animation. It shows my mother and grandmother bringing me to the railroad station on January 5th, 1939, just before the outbreak of World War II. And it shows them on the Frankfurter Bahnhof, the railroad station in Frankfurt. It shows them as if alone. They were not alone. They were all of the other, I'm sure that you have heard about the Kindertransport. In 1938, there was a conference in Evian um, saying, right after the night of broken glass, um, uh, Roosevelt, other leaders, and emissary, let's save German Jewry. The conference failed miserably. The only thing that came out of the conference was 
England, despite the fact that there were dark clouds on the horizon, took 10,000 Jewish children. Holland, Belgium, France, and Switzerland took 300 Jewish children from Germany for six months, hoping that the parents could find a way to leave. If I had been with the, the, the children to England, there's a reason interesting for you from, as a rabbi, but the children to England left, uh, lived, you know, survived. If I had been with a group of Holland, Belgium, or France, I would not be alive. Switzerland took, each of these countries took 300 children for six months. Then the war broke out, and the only ones from Holland, Belgium, France, and uh, Switzerland, the only ones that survived were the ones in Switzerland. So uh, it's very important what you people are doing is that younger children, but not in a frightening way, but younger children, that you are reaching them, and that's why you are going to get this as a gift. Thank you. One gift. I have more for you. <laughs> Well, I'd like to follow up on that piece of, so you were placed on the kinder transport as a young child. Your parents, the whole life, everything you had known was now leaving in the past. Where did you go to? Tell us about the home where you stayed in Switzerland and what life was like there for you. Okay, very fast. So here, January 5th, 1939, I'm at the railroad in Frankfurt. I went back to Frankfurt very often. I never go near that railroad. I make a big walk around it. I don't go near. I have no trouble with young people teaching them uh, Heidelberg and other universities, and I would go to the book fair. Not anymore, but I used to. So uh, in, in terms of what that was like is that I didn't want to go, but I had no choice. And I would have never in my wildest dreams as a 10 and a half year old, yeah. thought, because my father had said he comes back to Frankfurt, which is true, he did come back from the labor camp, and I would never have thought that the children's home in Switzerland, an Orthodox Jewish home, uh, Switzerland, that that would have become, it was called Wartheim. Uh, Wart, Warten in German means to wait. I would never have thought that I would be there for six years in that children's home, Orthodox Jewish children's home, paid by the Swiss Jewish um, community, and, um, and that, that I would never see my parents, the grandparents from the village or the grandmother from Frankfurt ever again. How it was in the, in the home is, first of all, for young people here, impossible for you to realize and to understand girls in those years could not go to high school. I don't have a high school diploma. I have a few honorary doctorates. I'm getting one at Ben Gurion, we'll talk about it. However, uh, the Swiss, they saved my life. If I hadn't been in that children's home that became an orphanage, I would not be alive. They had made one tremendous mistake. The people responsible for us in that, I did a longitudinal study for my masters, that's why I know about that. The people responsible for us were themselves refugees with the anxiety of what will happen to them. The headmistress of that home, Riesenfeld, told us our parents didn't love us. She said she wasn't married, she didn't have children, and she was herself a refugee. She said if she had a child, she would never let that child go. And she also said, we didn't ask for you to come. Your parents didn't love you. That's why they sent you. When I did this longitudinal study, I checked with the others. Am I remembering that correctly? And I did. On the other hand, every time when I talked to somebody like you, Rabbi, I, I say right away afterwards, if I hadn't been in that home, I wouldn't be alive. So there is an obligation on somebody like me to make a dent in society, but I did not know that the dent would be talking about that other subject that I usually talk about. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
you made reference to that being in Switzerland was what saved your life. Yes. As you and I talked about before, there's not, not everyone here might realize you and Anne Frank were both born in Germany within a year of each other, and yet your lives took such different paths. Right. Have you ever thought about the relationship between the two so of you? You, Rabbi Miller, are the first person, I'm now going to be 92 years old, you are the first person who is asking that. Really? And I have an answer. Very interesting, because first of all, I have an obligation because I survived to do something for society. I did not know it would be talking about sex from morning <laughs> to night. However, I would have never met Anne Frank, you know why? Not only because she moved to Holland and I stayed in Frankfurt. I came from an Orthodox Jewish family. They would have never let me eat a sandwich in an Anne Frank's house because somebody might give me a sandwich with uh, ham and butter, not kosher. So the only reason that I was on that group to Switzerland was because it was an Orthodox Jewish home. So when you said, when you asked me about that Anne Frank, nobody has ever asked that. Mm -hmm. She did come from Frankfurt. Mm -hmm. She did, she then went to Holland, same age. And every time when I think about Hannah Senesch, uh, who got killed by the uh, Nazis, and when I think about Anne Frank, I do have that firm feeling that I have to, to, to do something that you here are all doing by you having that museum. And I read in your brochure that one of the emphasis that you're having now is to reach younger children, which I think is fabulous. And you have to educate, which you are doing right now. You're sending teachers to, um, to, to Israel, uh, to, to Germany. To Germany, yeah. yeah to like, like on, a, on a tour. Yes. So uh, very, very important because otherwise that knowledge is getting lost. It is getting lost. And as you saw earlier, we recognized a few of the survivors who are here. The numbers are starting to dwindle. But I noticed in, in the documentary that that's not actually a term that you use to describe yourself, that instead you choose to use the term orphan right. of the Holocaust. Because, Can you talk about that? Yeah. Boy, you did your homework. <laughs> I don't, I, until recently, I did never call myself orphan of the Holocaust. I, call, I, I never called myself Holocaust survivor because I was never in a camp. I went from Switzerland in 1945, right after the war ended, I went to then Palestine. That's another chapter. We'll get to but, that story in a moment. Okay. <laughs> so I, up until very recently, I didn't want to take like your survivors here, who have been in this horrible Auschwitz, like my whole family who did not make it. I didn't want to be called um, a survivor. I called myself an orphan of the Holocaust, which is correct. I never saw any of that family again, so I was an orphan. Lately, I've changed my mind a little bit because so many people uh, understand better when you say a Holocaust survivor. Right. So I, I, I changed my mind, and now I'm very pleased. I'm on the board of directors of the Museum of Jewish Heritage in New York, and we have an exhibit, whoever comes to New York, please, we have an exhibit on Auschwitz. There were some people on the board who voted against having that exhibit because it was terribly expensive, millions. I played a card which I've never done before at the board meeting, raised my hand. I said, I'm playing a card which I've never done before. We need that exhibit because this is like a graveyard for my family. We have that exhibit, very successful, already prolonged, with that horrible car that's in front of the museum. When you come to New York with your wife, I will go with you there. Okay. And I pay you for lunch. <laughs> I will look forward to that visit very much. Uh, turning back, though, to your experiences, when did you hear 
what the news about your parents. When did you learn their fate, and, and what was that like for you? Okay. I still had a little hope, but not much. They did a terrible thing with us in that orphanage. They put us in the dining room right when the war ended, and they, all of us, all of the children, they read the names of the people who survived. They were stupid. Instead of taking the children, come to my office and talk to them, that's also in the animation that we are sitting there. That was terrible. And here is the uh, end of that story. I then went to Palestine, I went to Paris. Um, Yad Vashem, as all of you know, has lists of people. There are also some books, and my reform synagogue in New York has some of those books. So I, f I found out where, where my father, where my, uh, when he was killed with a date, because the Nazis kept dates. In my mother's, and you see that in the movie, the first time I saw that word in German, it's called verschollen. Verschollen means disappeared. So my mother, it said where she was born, it said her name was Hanauer, Irma Hanauer, and then it said the word verschollen. That was very upsetting to me to see that word because verschollen means disappeared. So even so they kept track of so many people, my mother's name has never been found. And I saw that, and I especially went back to Yad Vashem to show the next generation of how important it is that not to forget and to, right. and to stand up and to be counted. That she didn't disappear and you're keeping her memory alive. Right, exactly. That's very powerful. We think of you as an American icon today, yet, as you've alluded to, America wasn't your first stop after the war. Tell us about where you went after that. First, I, be, I became and still am an ardent Zionist. That I live here, I have no regrets. <laughs> but I, uh, in 1945, I did, despite the fact that I didn't have a high school diploma, I got accepted in Switzerland. We had to come to ask every six months to be able to stay another six months in the middle of the war. <laughs> Impossible, um, because we could see Germany from Haydn, where I was, I could see Germany and Liechtenstein and Austria on the Bodensee. There was no place for us to go. So um, I was accepted in a kindergarten seminary, but the moment the first boat left Switzerland, I mean, for, for Marseille, there's no border in Switzerland, uh, I, be, I became and still am an ardent Zionist. I was on that boat. I said, we don't need intellectuals. Palestine needs people to work the ground and to build a country so that we should never have no country of ours. And look how important it is right now with all of the things that are happening. So I was on that ship that went to then Palestine and all of us, it wasn't an act of heroism on my part, all of us went to some unit to fight for the existence of the state of Israel. I became, don't worry, I became a sniper. I can still put five bullets of a stand gun. I can throw hand grenades. And I show in the film that I know how to put a stand gun together. Uh, how come I'm so short? I was always short. How come that I became a sniper? I do not know, but I was a very good sniper, fortunately. I never had to kill anybody. But I could have if I needed to. And we watched on the rooftops of Jerusalem how the Israelis checked every car that came from the Arab countries. On my 20th birthday, on June 4th, 1948, I had finished my duty on the rooftop. I went to the girls' residence where I lived. I, the alarm sounded, I knew what it meant go down to the shelter. Somebody had given me a book for my birthday. It was my, it was my 20th birthday. I said, let me go first to get the book. Because who knows how many hours I have to sit there in that shelter. Big mistake. I came down to the 
hole, a cannonball from the Arab side exploded, killed two girls next to me, and wounded me very badly on both legs, but that's not why I'm short. I would have been short anyway. And then I'm telling in the documentary, they put me in, after the operation into a room with the soldiers. We kept the morale going, we played chess. I played chess with somebody who lost both eyes, later died. Some people who lost their hands because of hand grenades. And then there was a nurse there. I hope there's no nurse here. A stupid nurse. <laughs> she said, they, they were, first of all, there were no beds left. It was all soldiers. But I'm so short. They put me on a shelf. There was a library in that yeah. cloisters. And they put me on a shelf instead, no bed. And then there was a nurse who said, a girl cannot be here with all the boys. Stupid. We couldn't have done anything. My two feet were bandaged. I was on that shelf. But I found a way. There was a good looking, very good looking <laughs> medical student. I made believe that I couldn't eat. Nonsense. My hands were perfectly all right. He had to come and feed me three times a day. <laughs> so I thought I would be in a kibbutz f forever. After one year, I realized I needed to learn something. And then I went to Jerusalem to become a kindergarten teacher. That's where I got wounded. I never would have thought that I would not be in Israel. I then went to the, uh, I, I married, I was married a few times. I won't tell you about that. I don't want the, the, the rabbi to know, look at the movie. <laughs> so I went with one husband, husband number one, to Paris, he went to study medicine. And he wanted to go back to Israel, and I wanted to finish at the Sorbonne. Uh, I was fortunate to go to the Sorbonne. Uh, there was a, a law in France Anybody who didn't have a high school diploma, you could take an année préparatoire preparation year. If you passed the exam, you were accepted to the Sorbonne. Sorbonne was almost no money. So I, w I wanted to finish studying. My then first husband, whom I see every year still, uh, he wanted to go back to Israel. He didn't want to study medicine anymore. I came to the United States because an uncle, I knew already I had no family, an uncle, Many of you might know about that. Shanghai accepted Jews without a visa. An uncle, Uncle Max, went to Shanghai, then went to San Francisco. I thought I should not go back to Israel before visiting him. I will never have the money to go from Israel to San Francisco. So I got a check. I never took reparation. I'm not saying people shouldn't take it. I did not because I did not need it, but a check came to everybody who had not finished school. So I had a check in my hand. I did have a boyfriend. I said, we are going to visit America. That's how I came here. And I have not regretted it, but I go to Israel every year. I want to tell you something brand new, only the rabbi knows. See that pin? May 19th. I'm getting an honorary doctorate at Ben Gurion University, which makes me very happy because in 1948, I have a few here, but that's the first one in Israel. In 1948, I remember I was in Jerusalem. I remember Ben Gurion declaring the state of Israel. I can hear it in my ears. So this is wonderful. May 19, whoever is in Israel, Come to Ben Gurion University. Maybe you come. <laughs> Unfortunately, I won't be in Israel at that time, but I appreciate that invitation. Thinking about all of what's happened in your life, you had such a successful career once you got here to America. To what do you attribute that success? So, Rabbi, in the Jewish tradition, we never had to worry about sex being dirty or a sin like in some other religion, we always knew that sex with a husband and a wife, not just picking up somebody here, with a husband and a wife, is an obligation on Friday night and a mitzvah. So when I worked for Planned Parenthood of New York City, I trained paraprofessionals 
to be family planning counselors. It was difficult times in New York, unrest in Harlem, but we trained, I worked in Harlem, and I trained many, many paraprofessionals, and then had an opportunity to do the radio. I did the radio for 10 years every Sunday night from 10 to 12, and there is a woman here, her family calls her Dr. Ruth. It's all right, she remembers the, the radio program. And um, so I, then I realized that I did not know enough, and I was very fortunate by chance to get accepted at Cornell Medical School in New York to be trained also as a sex therapist. And for young people here, I want to tell you, if you can find a mentor, like the one I had, Helen Singer Kaplan, who was a foremost psychiatrist and psychologist, wrote the first book on the new sex therapy. If you can find a mentor, you do not have to become best friends. Use what they can give you to, uh, to, to learn. That's what I did. And I was fortunate that I, I do believe that by my being so Jewish, I never had the problem that you shouldn't talk about it. But at the same time, I also was old fashioned and a square, coming from an Orthodox Jewish family. These days I belong to a Reform temple and I belong to, um, uh, uh, not the Orthodox, but the Conservative in Riverdale. So I belong to two. But the important thing is that for us Jews, there is an important lesson here. On Friday night, you can, whoever has a partner here, make believe that today is Friday. Go home, <laughs> listen to me careful. There is a prayer that's called Eshet Chayil Mimza, a woman of valor who can find. Towards the very end, there is one sentence that's the most sexually arousing sentence because the husband says to the wife, there are wonderful women out there who do wonderful things like charity, like raising money, all kinds of things. And he says to her on Friday night, but you are the very best. And in my area of specialty, there is no better sexually arousing sentence than for a husband to say to his wife, you are the best. All of you who have a wife here, Make believe it's Friday night. <laughs> and then please do a new position. <laughs> Give me a call so that I learn something new. <laughs> so, so I, have a, I have another gift for you. <laughs> <laughs> Here is the latest book, The Doctor is In. Oh, In case you have nothing else to do. <laughs> I have something else. Here is, I can't give you that. As we speak, NYU Press, Heavenly Sex, I did with an Orthodox writer, Jonathan Mark from the Jewish Week, is becoming a classic, will never be out of print. But I can't give you that. Oh, I have more. Susan? Susan? Come here. Okay, one for you and one for the rabbi. My motto in life is to take a risk. And I talk very often, since I was a kindergarten teacher, to small children, and I do believe in, a, in the image of a turtle. Now, don't give me any more. My apartment in Washington Heights has a lot of turtles, not live ones, little. But here, two days ago, Here's my book, the turtle is called Leopold. And the turtle has to stick its neck out and take a risk. And that's what all of you are doing. Everybody right now here who is giving you some money for the museum is taking a little bit of a risk. This is for Susan. Two days ago, I got Leopold in animation. It's 11 uh, minutes for small children. One for you, one set for you, and one set for the rabbi, for the Hebrew school, right here. 
It, it does not talk about the turtle's sex life. Thank you. So, <clears throat> so you talked, you shared about your. I made the rabbi uh, It was bound to happen. <laughs> Uh, you, you talked about your professional life, and, and in the Hulu documentary, one of the things that stood out to me was one of your producers, when talking about what it was like watching you interact with people as you were up there on TV and listening to these callers, is that you treated, in his words, everyone as if everyone was normal. No matter what they presented, you treated them with respect and didn't judge them for who they were. I wondered as I was watching that, after being through the Holocaust, if that had an influence on the way that you see other people and you treat people who might be different than yourself? No question, yes. Because at that time, AIDS raised its ugly head. At that time, homosexuality, the big problem. At that time, people didn't even talk about homosexuality. In the very orthodox Jewish tradition, we have a problem that if a man sleeps with another man as if it was a woman, Mot Yamut should be killed. Things have changed. And I got out of it by saying, we still don't know the etiology, the reason for homosexuality, but every single person has to be respected, period. Respect is not debatable. That helped me also. That helped me a great deal with talking about homosexuality. And I just said, I, we don't know the etiology, the reason, and the sages also didn't know. So uh, today things are different. I just had, saw the headline that um, the Theological Seminary in New York is looking at, at gayness. No, but I would have never believed that that day would happen. But what I did believe and for what I stood up is to say that um, respect in terms of people, uh, whoever they are, is, is not debatable. That's a, a beautiful uh, message. Now, one thing that stood out to me, for all of your fame, for all of your renown, you still live in the same apartment in Washington Heights for the last 50 years. 55. 55 <laughs> years. Now, it could be that it's rent controlled, or, no. but how, how did you manage to keep a level head with all of your fame and your place? If you would see, first of all, it was the place of refugees. And that's where I belong. It was the place for German Jewish refugees because it's high up next to the George Washington Bridge. It's near Fort Ryan Park, where I'm on the board. And it is overlooking the Hudson overlooking the Palisade, I told David Rockefeller before he died, thank you to the Rock, I said, I don't want money. Just thank you to the Rockefeller family for buying the Palisades. It's next to Fort Ryan Park. The German Jews at the time, when they came just before World War II, the ones that were rescued, the ones that could come here, they loved Washington Heights. Now it's called Hudson Heights. Mm. They loved it because it's very European, it's high up, it's next to magnificent uh, Fort Ryan Park, next to the Cloisters, which is part of the Metropolitan Museum. In the summer, they didn't go to Naples. <laughs> in, in winter, they didn't have money. Uh, but in the summer, it was cool, because it was up, they didn't have air conditioning, the, the, the people who came as refugees. Um, so I have, I raised my children there, two children. My son, a professor at uh, the University of Ottawa. My daughter, a doctor in education also. And first of all, I don't think I could move because I have too much junk. <laughs> <laughs> but also, after my late husband, who I was married for almost 40 years, and after my friend was an engineer, after he died, I thought maybe I should move a little bit further downtown. And that thought was just five minutes. Maybe, maybe not five minutes, a few minutes. And I'm actually uh, very happy there. My daughter lives about 10 minutes from me in Riverdale. So just two questions. 
then we're going to wrap up our conversation. This has been such a delight. And I, I'm sure it came across to everyone your wonderful sense of humor. As you said, the Talmudic piece about humor as a way to teach. I have to ask, given all that you've been through, the Holocaust, even fighting in the War of Independence for Israel, the challenges that you've seen, how have you managed to keep such a lively sense of humor? I think because I'm so Jewish. <laughs> I, I, I really think that, that if you, I'm serious when I, you know, when I have to be serious, but I also say that, that like what I said before, that if you teach with humor, the students walk out and remember what you said. Even at, the, even at your seminary of the reform rabbis, um, so I don't know. I, I, I think I have to be grateful. My father wrote poetry every letter, every week before they went to uh, Auschwitz. Every thing, and I have some of the letters in the in the movie, and some of them were, were funny. So I must have inherited something about not only the Orthodox Jewish attitude, uh, but also something about uh, keeping your head above, above and, 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 and seeing the humor where it can help. Not jokes. Most jokes I don't get. I, that's a typical German, Jewish, uh, German. I don't get the jokes, but I can see the humor in some of the things that are happening. From Sinai to Seinfeld, humor has been a part of us. So I understand that's, that's how humor will be part of yeah. it. I want to say something else to this. Sure. Uh, uh, well, that, that's my last question. Is what would be the final message you'd like the to deliver? The final message I want to tell you. Up until very recently, I have never talked about politics in this country. I vote since I became an American citizen. I do not talk about politics. I don't talk about the sex lives of the famous people. Even the things that I know about them, I don't talk. <laughs> And lately, and that concerns all of us here, lately I've changed my mind. I talk about three things that make me sad. One is when I see children being separated from their parents at the border, because that's my story. And the other thing is that uh, abortion has become again a political football. And the other thing is that in this wonderful country of ours, there is not enough money for family planning since I worked so many years for Planned Parenthood. So there are three things that I don't go on any bandwagon, but there are three things that, that I have at the age of 91, now almost 92, have changed my mind. And what I want to tell you, that you should walk out of here very proud because you are involved in a wonderful wonderful endeavor. And whoever comes to New York, don't forget my museum, the uh, Jewish heritage. And you, I take you and your wife. You're, I'm you're looking happy. forward to it. And Susan, I take you too. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ruth. Thank you. And to God's Thank you. Okay.